Their wedding took place on a beautiful summer day, with the sun shining in the sky and a gentle breeze caressing the guests' faces. Among them stood the young bride and groom, Ethan and Stella. They smiled at each other. Ethan wore a suit with a tie, and Stella was in a magnificent wedding dress. Then he took her hand in his. They stood on a red carpet. The officiant, with tenderness in his voice, said, Groom, I can't imagine happiness without you. The bride replied, Happiness without you. Then their lips met in a soft kiss. Their kiss was interrupted by applause and joyful exclamations from the guests gathered around. The wedding music began to play, and the newlyweds walked up the red carpet together, embracing their future filled with love and joy. Time flew by quickly. Memory kindly provided another recollection. Ethan and Stella continued to enjoy their life together. Soon they had a son, and standing at the hospital discharge, they were happy. Ethan said, look at him, our little miracle. Stella replied, yes, he is as beautiful as you, Stella. But life never promised to be a fairy tale. One day, Ethan disappeared. Stella found herself in deep emotional and psychological emptiness. Her days and nights were filled with endless tears, fear, and anxiety, and her heart felt as if it was being torn apart. In despair and pain, she sat in her living room when an unknown number called her phone. Stella flinched, shrinking inwardly from a panic attack, but answered the call. Who is this? she asked anxiously. We know your husband is missing. He is with us. To get him back, you'll have to pay a ransom, said the kidnapper on the other end of the line, carefully altering their voice. Where is he? Is he alive? What do you want? Stella asked with trembling lips. Alive, but his health depends on us. We need money, a lot of money, to release him. I'll send instructions on how and where to deliver the money. But don't even think about alerting anyone or involving the police. If anything goes wrong, your husband will pay with his life. I promise. I'll do whatever you say. Please, give me back my husband, Stella said with desperation in her voice. Recalling that period was difficult. Endless hours of waiting, hoping for a call from the kidnappers, waiting for instructions on how to deliver the ransom and get her loved one back. Her anxiety and fear were unbearable. After some time, Stella gathered a huge sum of money as the kidnappers had demanded and followed their instructions to deliver the money to a secluded place. This wasn't a problem, as she was a wealthy heiress from her late father. Stella did this in complete secrecy, not telling anyone or involving the police. Her soul was torn with anxiety and hoped that this might be the only way to bring Ethan home alive. However, when the money was handed over, her husband still did not return. Were we deceived? Stella whispered bitterly into the dark window frame. Returning home after handing over the money, Stella immediately noticed something was wrong. The rooms were in complete disarray. All valuables, money, jewelry, and even important documents had been stolen. Even the secret safe had been hidden. Why is all this happening to me? Stella whispered helplessly as she looked at the scattered and literally torn belongings. Someone hadn't just robbed her. It felt as though they had intentionally deprived her of all means of support. The strangest part of the situation was that the thief was clearly well informed about where the valuables were kept. Stella was left alone with her fear and despair. It was another heavy blow right to her back that she had not expected at all. There was no money left for the ransom now, and she felt like she had nothing left, as if fate had decided to play a cruel game with her, testing how much more she could endure. But the worst part was not even that. It was that, by that time, her little boy had started to feel strangely unwell. Mom, I don't feel good, Chris said one day. What's wrong? Does something hurt? 
Stella asked anxiously. My chest hurts a lot, Mom, her son replied weakly. Don't worry, I'll stay with you until the doctor arrives, Stella said with a trembling voice, tucking her son into bed. She quickly called for an ambulance and waited for their arrival, holding him close and not letting go for a second. Stella, I'm afraid your son has a serious heart defect. We see an issue with the organ that requires urgent intervention, the doctor said firmly. What does that mean, doctor? She asked in a dead voice. We need to perform surgery as soon as possible. Otherwise, his heart won't function properly and it could be very dangerous for him, the doctor explained patiently. Tell me what we need to do. I'm willing to do anything to save my son. I'll refer you to a specialized medical center where experienced surgeons can perform the operation. It will be challenging, but there is still a chance of success, the doctor replied. Stella sold her family home and her small business to pay for Chris's surgery. Everything she had left, she sacrificed to save his life. The recovery after the surgery was long and difficult. And now, after all the hardships, she found herself in a small shack, barely making ends meet. Stella bitterly remembered the times when she had money, comfort, and far-reaching plans. But she had no regrets about her decisions. Family had always been her top priority. Stella, have you ever thought that your husband might have set you up? Her friend Monica asked cautiously during a visit. Stella could not even entertain the thought that her husband might have betrayed her. Her loyalty had been unwavering. She had sacrificed everything to protect and save her family. But think about it. No one but the two of you knew about that safe, and no lock was broken. Monica continued her reasoning. Stella was uncomfortable. Her friend was clearly making an effort, but Stella firmly disagreed. No, that can't be. We were happy, everything was fine. No, I'm sure it was someone else. They must have tortured him and found out everything that way, Stella said with a fervent certainty in her eyes. Well, if you think so, but I still think you should be careful, Monica replied. That was Monica's last visit. After the business collapse, Stella felt betrayed by fate. Her entire life seemed like a great disappointment, but perhaps one of the hardest blows was that her former friends had turned away from her. These women, with whom she had shared many joys and sorrows, were not ready to support her in her most difficult time. That's what all your friendship is worth, Stella said bitterly. When Monica ignored her call again, Stella sat alone and empty in her small kitchen. An elderly woman who lived nearby became the only comfort in her life. Oh, don't be so down. We'll manage somehow, she said cheerfully. Thank you for being here. It's really hard for me lately. So much trouble and loss, Stella sighed. I know, Stella, and I'm always ready to help. If you need help with the boy or just someone to talk to, you know I'm always here, the neighbor replied. Conversations with the neighbor were one of the few sources of support for Stella, but they could not fully heal her wounds and suffering. Every time she pondered her fate, she felt even more frightened and vulnerable. She tried to stay strong and be there in difficult times, but painful memories and the uncertainty about her husband's fate left her restless, as if things were getting worse each time. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. The uncertainty torments me the most, Stella shook her head. She was plagued by questions about whether Ethan was alive or not. These tormenting questions poisoned every night, preventing her from sleeping. Three years passed. Memories had faded over time, life went on, and Stella had a son who needed her. The problem was that Stella struggled to find stable work, desperately trying to make ends meet. Returning to business was nearly impossible. She had no money to buy back her old company or even to start a new one. Once again, she was fired. Can you believe it? Stella said bitterly. 
I worked as a waitress at such and such place. And what? Do I smile too little? How can you smile when they pay pennies? Even food is barely enough, she added. Stella continued to bear the burden of life on her shoulders, but it became heavier with each passing day. Her impoverished existence felt like an endless struggle, and she was weary of this load. Stella, I heard about a place where you could find a job, the neighbor said seriously. I would be grateful for any job. So, a woman needs a caregiver. The people are decent, and they promise to pay well. Okay, Stella agreed. I'd go myself, but they won't take me into someone else's home now. You'd be just right for the job. But I don't have medical training. You can't become a nurse in a couple of days, Stella shook her head. Don't worry, this job doesn't require medical skills. It's just that a wealthy lady, who is pregnant and can't manage on her own, needs a housekeeper and caregiver in one. Essentially, she's looking for someone who can help with household chores and also be a support. My friend told me about her, and I think you would be a good fit. Do you think so? Stella asked with doubt. I'm not sure. How do you care for pregnant women? I've never tried. It's not complicated. Just remember how you were when you were pregnant, and everything will fall into place. She will like you. She's looking for someone honest and reliable. And I know you're like that. Give it a try, Stella. It could be a good opportunity for you. It doesn't hurt to ask, her friend said. The offer was indeed tempting. Stella went to Judith's luxurious home. Everything was tastefully decorated and seemed so expensive that Stella felt a pang of nostalgia. Yes, once my life was like this, she thought with sadness as she approached the mansion's front door. Hello, I'm here for the caregiver position, Stella greeted when the homeowner opened the door. Good day. Please, come in, Judith replied mechanically, holding her large belly with her hand. She greeted her guest with a smile and led her into a spacious living room. I feel so lonely and scared in this big house, Judith said with a shy smile. My husband is away on a long business trip and won't be able to return before the baby is born. I'm afraid I might have to give birth alone, and I really need help, Judith said. Stella realized the immense responsibility that rested on Judith's shoulders. She felt sympathy for her and tried to put herself in Judith's shoes. Don't worry, I understand that pregnancy and childbirth are difficult. Honestly, it can drive you crazy. I'm ready to provide you with support and help as much as I can, Stella said. Judith smiled. It seems we understand each other. I like you, Stella. When can you start working? Right away. Stella replied. Judith handed over the prepared contract, and Stella took a pen and confidently signed her name, internally grateful to her neighbor. However, being in this luxurious mansion, Stella couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of longing for her lost wealth and comfort. The opulence surrounding her in Judith's home reminded her of what her own life had been like, and these reminders weighed heavily on her. Stella settled into the job. She not only took care of Judith, but also diligently cleaned and helped around the house, striving to create a comfortable and cozy environment for the pregnant homeowner. One day, they decorated the nursery for the upcoming twins, arranging stuffed animals and decor. Stella, I'm so grateful for your help. You've made the house so cozy, Judith said. I don't know how I would have managed without you, Stella replied. Oh, don't be modest. It's just a few decorations. Honestly, you've helped me much more. After being fired from the restaurant, we didn't even have anything to eat, Stella responded. I hope your children won't experience such hardship. Honestly, I'm worried about their future, Judith said, looking embarrassed. 
It's twins, and I don't know how I'll manage with two at once. I've never had even one. Don't worry, I'm here. We'll manage somehow, Stella said, shrugging. Well, look at this beauty. The women stepped back from the nursery to admire their handiwork. The nursery was indeed stunning, and for a moment, Stella felt a painful pang of unfairness, realizing that her son hadn't experienced such joy. There are no pictures of your husband in the house. That's a bit strange. Where is he? Stella asked, shaking off the unwelcome thoughts. Judith strangely pursed her lips, looked away, and fidgeted. She seemed unwilling to bring up the subject. Listen, I've forgotten everything. I prepared a small gift for your son to thank you for your help. Judith changed the topic of conversation. Stella found this odd, but decided not to raise the issue for now. Even though she was curious to meet Judith's husband, she chose to wait for the right moment. Judith, on the other hand, seemed to avoid discussions about her husband's photographs. She stood shifting from foot to foot and then suddenly said, Listen, could you help tidy up the guest room? It seems like it hasn't been cleaned for a while. Judith took her assistant by the arm and began leading her out of the nursery. Sure, I'll help, Stella replied, somewhat surprised. No problem. Let's do it right now. Judith suddenly stopped as if realizing something. There's one place in the house, in the wing with the guest rooms, that I'd advise against entering. It's my husband's office. He always considers it his personal space, and I'd like to keep it that way. Let him dust it off himself if he's so particular. Right, you're the hostess, it's up to you, Stella shrugged. Judith nodded and led her away again, talking about her grand plans for cleaning. It seemed like she was trying very hard to distract her assistant, which was indeed strange. Weeks went by. Stella continued to struggle with internal doubts. What to do about the office? She understood that entering someone's personal space without permission was wrong, but every day as she passed the closed office door, she asked herself, maybe just a peek. No one would know. After several weeks, she decided she could no longer live in ignorance. She waited until Judith was distracted, sneaked into the right wing, opened the door, and saw photographs of her missing husband, Ethan. It can't be, Stella whispered. The shock of the sight left her pale-lipped and overwhelmed. Her heart stopped for a moment, and she felt the ground shifting beneath her. Suddenly, all her doubts vanished, and her mind was filled with just one thought, Ethan is here, in this house. The moment Stella saw her husband's photographs in that office, her mind was filled with a clear logical chain of events. All the puzzle pieces in her head began to fit together, piercing her heart with merciless truth. This means he is alive. But why then did he hide from me and start living with another woman? Stella mumbled, already knowing the answer. It's a scam. He deceived me, robbed me, and left, just as Monica said. And now, he might be planning to deceive Judith as well. Stella understood she needed to tell the truth, but she didn't know how to do it without hurting Judith's feelings. They had only just started building their relationship, and now she would have to talk about the betrayal of Judith's own husband. Stella knew this news could damage their relationship, so she decided to postpone the conversation, continuing to help Judith until she was ready. Judith, despite her outward friendliness, was a woman who knew well that in this world, one could trust no one. I had a feeling you wouldn't keep it, Judith said sadly, looking at the monitor. Her house was equipped with surveillance cameras, and she kept a close watch on everything happening inside and around it. I was so hopeful. Judith's husband's warnings about enemies and risks replayed in her mind. She knew that even Stella, despite her kindness and honesty, could not be an exception to the rule, and now, as sad as it was, all her fears were confirmed. 
Quiet, children, quiet, Judith said, stroking her large belly. It seemed the babies could sense their mother's anxiety. Judith was in her final trimester and felt her babies moving inside her. She was worried about her safety, and this fear was clearly affecting them. Could I be in danger? Judith murmured, looking at Stella, who was frozen beside her husband's photograph. Perhaps it was espionage related to her husband's business. Judith began to think about how to deal with Stella. She considered various ways to eliminate the perceived threat, but was also concerned about her condition and her children's future. Something's wrong today, she grimaced, feeling a sharp pain in her lower abdomen. Could it be anything else? Judith felt a sharp pain and realized that labor had begun. Thoughts of spies immediately vanished, replaced by fear. Hello, ambulance, urgent call, I'm in labor. Judith shouted into the phone, dialing emergency services. Call accepted, but I must tell you, you'll have to wait, the voice on the other end said. What? Don't you understand? I'm in labor. I hear you, but there are snowdrifts on the roads. Even with the best intentions, the ambulance is unlikely to reach you before they're cleared. The dispatcher's confused voice only added to Judith's anxiety. So, I'll have to give birth at home, she said in horror, and another contraction seized her. Stella, please, she called out, showing that she wasn't in the best shape. The maid was genuinely terrified, but being alone in this situation was even scarier. Judith called her several more times before her assistant managed to arrive. She rushed to her and, in a flurry, poured out water and said, I'll have to give birth right here. There's no choice. No one else is around right now. And what about the ambulance? No one will come because of the snow. All the roads are blocked. Oh God, please help me. I'm scared. It hurts and it seems we don't have time. Although Stella was shocked by the sudden situation, she immediately set about organizing what was necessary. Supporting Judith at this difficult moment was crucial, despite her own discoveries and fears. Hold on, I'll get a towel and water, she said, taking a deep breath. The responsibility for delivering Judith fell heavily on her fragile shoulders. It was uncomfortable for Stella to think that she had to assist Ethan's lover, the man she loved with all her heart. The tangled emotions were burning her unhappy heart. But Stella was too kind to leave Judith in trouble, even though she no longer liked her. Come on, breathe, she urged, needing to focus. Stella looked at the suffering Judith and felt her own pain. Looking at the woman who, it turned out, had been involved with Ethan, Stella realized that the babies trying to come into the world were not to blame for what had happened between their parents. She knew she needed to do everything she could to help Judith and ensure the safe delivery of the babies. It hurt so much. Judith cried out, squeezing Stella's hand tightly. Breathe, breathe, you're strong, you'll get through this, Stella tried to reassure her. She had to overcome her own feelings and disappointments to save multiple lives. Looking at Judith, Stella couldn't shake the thought that she had taken her husband away. On the other hand, Judith suspected Stella of espionage. Both women, faced with unexpected circumstances and difficulties, began to suspect each other of something, adding tension to an already complex situation. After hours of effort and a tense delivery process, Stella and Judith finally realized that it was over. I think we did well, Judith whispered wearily. Yeah, Stella replied, wiping her sweaty forehead with a clean towel. They had managed so well that Judith had successfully delivered twins, despite the lack of medical expertise. Stella proved to be quite the capable midwife. The babies were born healthy and without any complications. Are they really okay? Judith asked, looking at the babies. I'm not sure, 
but they look very content, Stella answered. At that moment, both women felt an incredible sense of relief and joy. They realized they had handled this incredibly challenging situation together, despite their disagreements and suspicions. Joy and gratitude overflowed in their hearts as they looked at the two healthy newborns, who were quietly cooing in their baby language and moving their tiny hands and feet. I hope the ambulance hasn't forgotten about you, Stella said soothingly. Judith was lying on the floor, her face reflecting a mix of emotions, fear and joy from the birth of her children, along with dissatisfaction and suspicion toward Stella. Suddenly, she decided to voice her thoughts, feeling they were bubbling inside her. Stella, you're conducting surveillance, aren't you? Yes, I saw you entering my husband's office. What were you looking for there? Documents? Compromising evidence? Money? Stella shifted her position slightly and looked at Judith. You've misunderstood everything. Yes, I went into your husband's office, but I wasn't searching for anything. It was just curiosity, but in the end. In the end? In the end, you just violated my request, the only rule in this house, Stella sighed heavily. She realized the hour of confrontation was unavoidable, no matter how hard she tried to protect Judith from it. Judith, when I found out my husband was missing, I was devastated. I thought he was dead, and then I was overcome with grief and loneliness. I didn't know how to go on. I'm sorry, of course, but... You see, your husband isn't who he claims to be. What do you mean? Ethan? We were married, and he staged his own kidnapping to extract all my money and then simply ran away. What? Judith shook her head in disbelief. Tears suddenly welled up in her eyes. No, this can't be. He's been away on a business trip. What are you saying? That he's moved on? When he disappeared, I felt so lonely. I was literally in your shoes. Ethan robbed me and then obviously turned to you. He probably plans to do the same with you. They fell silent, each lost in their own thoughts. Well, finally, Stella muttered, seeing the ambulance lights flashing outside. She went to open the door, leaving the homeowner to wait for help. Judith met the paramedics with tear-filled eyes. All these years, she had trusted Ethan, believing they would overcome all difficulties together. Now, it became clear that her husband had been deceiving her all along. Suspicious moments and changes in their relationship were just part of a facade, excuses to cover up his schemes. All right, get ready, Stella said, leading the paramedics with the stretcher. They helped Judith up, carefully placed her on the stretcher, and began to transport her toward the exit. Stella, please, keep an eye on the house while I'm gone. I hope you're not upset with me. I'm so sorry, Judith said grabbing the assistant's hand. Of course, go peacefully. Everything will be fine. I'll take care of the house, Stella replied. Thank you, the new mother sighed, already seeing Judith off to the ambulance. Stella noticed that Judith had left her phone behind. She wanted to run after the ambulance, but it had already left. All right, I'll bring it tomorrow, she muttered, glancing at the cell phone calmly resting on the nightstand. The large house felt oddly empty, and every corner seemed to harbor danger. Even the shadows created a sinister illusion of Ethan's looming presence. Judith was still in the hospital when her phone rang for the first time. Stella, feeling a wave of panic and fear, knew she had to answer. She couldn't just run away. It took a great effort to compose herself, but this was the only way to dispel her fears. Yes, Ethan, hello, Stella said, carefully altering her voice and pretending to be Judith. How are you, darling? What's happening? came the voice from the speaker. Everything is fine, Stella replied, 
a bit tired but managing. The children are healthy. I miss you, Stella whispered with trembling lips. I'm glad to hear that you and the kids are okay. I'll be back soon. I want to see the twins and you. Aren't you home now? No, I'm in the hospital for rehabilitation. I'm waiting for you, darling. Come back soon. All right, Judith, see you soon, Ethan said and hung up. Stella sighed heavily. Her heart felt empty. It seemed Judith had reached the final stage of their relationship where the husband was preparing to clean out their house. Don't worry, I'll give you a proper welcome, Stella said, feeling her heart fill with anger and resentment. On the appointed day, the living room of the house was beautifully arranged. The lighting was soft, and the room was bathed in the gentle glow of numerous candles, creating a romantic atmosphere. Stella wore an elegant dress that accentuated her natural beauty. Her eyes sparkled with anticipation as she waited for Ethan to arrive. Now I hate you, Stella said as she opened the door. Ethan walked in, his gaze settling on Stella. What are you doing here? he said, somewhat bewildered. Ethan clearly wasn't expecting to see the woman he had betrayed, the one who had believed him dead for years, completely unaware of the deceitful game this treacherous man was playing. Stella, is that really you? he said, astonished. Yes, darling, it's me. Aren't you happy to see me? Ethan was stunned. The endless passion and devotion that she once felt for him were no longer in his eyes. Do you think I'll accept your apology so easily? Do you think they can change the past or heal a heart that no longer belongs to you? Believe me, I won't let you cause any more harm, including to Judith, Stella said with malice. Do you think you can stop me? Ethan retorted with equal malice. Believe me, I'll give you a reception worthy of your actions, Stella replied, feeling her anger and determination only growing stronger. You bitch! Ethan suddenly realized he no longer had control of the situation. Rage boiled inside him, and he even raised his hand to strike Stella. But at that moment, the police burst into the house. Ethan, you are under arrest for suspicion of fraud and robbery. This is a mistake, he protested. There is no mistake. I filed a complaint, Stella said. How exactly are you pulling this off? Ethan spat threateningly. I don't think you need to worry about that, the officer said, twisting Ethan's arms. In the next moment, Ethan was arrested and taken out of the house. Stella watched with relief. She suspected she wasn't the only one affected by Ethan's actions. Others might also have fallen victim to his fraud and lies. Stella entered the room where Judith was lying, seizing the opportunity to visit her. She smiled, trying to lift the spirits of her unwilling fellow sufferer. Hi, Judith. How are you feeling? Hi. It's getting better, but it's still a bit tense. You're here for a reason, Judith said, looking at her. Yes, you guessed right. I have some important news that you might not want to hear. Go ahead, there's nothing to do here anyway, Judith sighed. Stella began to recount to Judith the entire story with Ethan and how they ended up entangled in this complicated situation. She detailed how Ethan deceived her and later tried to steal money. Judith listened attentively, her expression changing from surprise to disappointment. When Stella finished her story, Judith pondered. Is it true? Did all this happen right before my eyes? And I didn't even suspect it. I'm so sorry that this happened to you and your son. I can't believe I felt regret, pain, and loss from parting with someone I loved. Nevertheless, the illusion Ethan created managed to touch my soul. Yes, it's true, Judith. But now you know everything, and that's better than living a lie. Thank you, Stella. 
I'll never forget what you've done for me, for us. Now, just focus on recovering peacefully. Although Ethan was now out of the picture, Judith smiled and felt some relief, realizing that she was no longer in danger. Seeing her serene face, Stella felt joy but also a tinge of sadness that there was no one to support her during this difficult time. The next day, Stella came to visit Judith again, bringing a box of pies. As usual, she showed care and attention to her employer, whom she had been helping for the past few weeks. Hi, Judith. How are you feeling? Hi, Stella. Thank you for caring so much. I'm a bit tired, but overall, I'm fine. You've really spoiled me with your treats, Judith joked good-naturedly. Stella smiled and sat down beside her. They chatted about future plans, and at some point, Stella suddenly noticed a mole on Judith's collarbone. It was an exact replica of a mole on her own body, in the same place. This moment made her look at Judith with a new perspective. Judith, I just noticed that we have the same mole on our collarbones. Isn't that strange? Stella said thoughtfully. She pulled back her collar to show her own mark. That is strange, but I doubt we could be relatives. I don't have any close family, and it seems you don't either. Yes, I lost my family a long time ago and don't know anything about my parents, Stella said sadly. They continued their conversation, but now with a special sense of closeness, even though they couldn't understand the origin of the moles. Lying in the hospital, Judith, out of boredom and curiosity, decided to take a DNA test to check the possibility of their relationship. A couple of days passed. Judith was still lying in her room when a strange man in a business suit arrived with an envelope containing the DNA test results. Good afternoon, Judith. My name is Nathan. I'm a lawyer, and I've been assigned an important task. I'm here to deliver these documents to you. What? I thought this would be handled by the administrator, Judith said, surprised. Or is this some special case? Indeed, it is special, the lawyer nodded. The result confirms that you are sisters. But how is that possible? I had no idea I might have a sister, Judith said, bewildered. It's a long story, the lawyer replied, taking a seat in the visitor's chair. Many years ago, a wealthy woman gave birth to twins and died from bleeding. That was your mother. Your father, Gregory, decided to raise you alone, but later found out he was terminally ill. He had no relatives who could help, so he decided to divide his savings in half and give them to two different families to raise you without knowing about each other. Why make it so complicated? Judith exclaimed, stunned. Your father, as far as I know, took this secret to his grave. He entrusted me with overseeing you and telling you the truth if you ever met. Judith was astonished. This was unexpected, shocking news that suddenly changed her life. She felt that her world had been filled with meaning and significance that it lacked before. At this stage in life, Stella and Judith found comfort and support in each other, and Stella moved into Judith's house with her son, Chris. It's great that we now live with Aunt Judith, Chris said. Yes, that's true, Stella confirmed. She was sitting on the floor, playing with the children and smiling at them. Judith came over and looked at them with an equally happy smile on her face. He's so sweet, Judith said, looking at her nephew. Yes, but I hope he doesn't inherit his father's traits, Stella said half seriously. You know, Judith, I wanted to say thank you. You've done so much for me. Without your help, I probably would never have been able to start my own business. I'm very grateful to you, Judith said. For you, sister, I would do anything. Judith nodded. We are family, and our father's money belongs to both of us. I know, 
but I want to do everything fairly so that you also have a share in the success of our business. Thank you, Stella. But the most important thing is that we have each other now. Stella worked diligently on growing her new venture. Finally, the day came when she was able to open her own firm. She started as a private real estate agent, but over time the business began to expand. She hired a staff, including a janitor, a limping young man named Taylor. Apparently, for this reason, some people in the office didn't like him. Hey, one-legged Joe, where are you rushing off to? One of the employees mocked as he followed the janitor. None of your business, Taylor muttered, trying to get away from their gaze. What rudeness, the manager retorted, skillfully knocking the stick from Taylor's hands, causing him to lose his balance. What do you want? To you you apologize, another employee sneered. Watching you limp around here is quite something, he continued. Hearing the commotion, Stella emerged from her office. Her stern voice rang out. What's going on here? Nothing much, just chatting. The bully smiled, blocking the janitor with his back. If you think you can mock someone just because of their disability, then you definitely don't belong in my company, Stella said with a furrowed brow. Apologies, we didn't mean it. It was just a joke. Get out of here immediately, Stella commanded. But not in front of me. Taylor's limp is not an excuse to make fun of him. Everyone in this company should respect one another, regardless of personal differences. The bullies immediately vanished. Only the embarrassed janitor remained, struggling to keep his balance against the wall. Here, Stella said, handing him his stick. Thank you. It's hard to do anything about it, Taylor sighed. My life used to be different, but now dealing with mockery has become a routine. What do you mean? Stella asked. Taylor leaned on his cane, hesitated a moment as if unsure whether to share, but then decided to speak. I once managed to complete a few courses at an economics university before dropping out. I needed to take care of my mom. She got seriously ill. Why did you drop out of university? Stella asked, surprised. My mom got seriously ill, and I had to take care of her, Taylor said sadly. I needed to pay the medical bills, so I took a side job in construction. That's where I got injured, which is why I limp with a cane now. I'm sorry, Taylor, Stella said sympathetically, shaking her head. It's nothing, but thank you for your sympathy, he replied with a wry smile. Since then, Taylor's situation troubled Stella. Working as a mere janitor was a clear waste of his talents. Talk to your sister, she thought, deciding to discuss with Judith how to improve Taylor's situation. She decided to offer him a better option. Taylor, I have a small proposal for you, Stella said, approaching him in the office. Yes, of course, what can I do? Clean somewhere, he asked, nodding. No. I just see that your current job is not quite your level, so I want to offer you something better. How about becoming a house and garden assistant for me? The salary will be even higher than here, and you definitely won't be harassed. Well, if that's true, I wouldn't mind, Taylor said, happy at the chance to escape from his unpleasant colleagues. I could probably help you with documents as well. After all, I've completed several economics courses and understand numbers much better than cleaning floors. All right, then it's settled. Weeks went by. Taylor worked diligently, helping Stella and Judith. He took care of the garden, the house, handled paperwork, and gradually became an indispensable member of the family. There was even a budding sympathy between him and Stella. They talked more often, spent time together, and life seemed to be settling into a peaceful rhythm. Until one day, while Stella and Judith were with the children in the house, a loud crash was heard. Suddenly, masked intruders burst in, demanding money and valuables. 
The sisters were horrified, and the children were crying. What's happening? Taylor tried to understand, while he was in the garden. Hearing the commotion and screams, he dashed into the house. As best as he could, Taylor emerged from around the corner, gripping his cane threateningly. Quickly scanning the intruders, he took a deep breath and put on a confident expression. You'd better leave while you still can, he said, pointing to the alarm he had activated a minute earlier. The police will be here soon. Taylor wasn't entirely confident in his own abilities, and of course, he was scared to face the intruders alone. But he couldn't leave the women and children in danger, so he merely tightened his grip on his cane. Is that your defense? What do you think of this? One of the intruders pulled out a gun and aimed it at the former janitor. You won't shoot, Taylor said firmly, looking directly into the assailant's eyes. The robber's hand trembled, and the bullet, deflected by the shot, wounded Taylor. He collapsed to the floor. Are you out of your mind? His accomplice shouted. Why did you start shooting? And why the hell did he come at us with a stick? The shooter yelled back. Let's get out of here. I didn't sign up for this. In the distance, sirens wailed, and the strangers, fearing the consequences, fled. It hurts so much. Taylor coughed, clutching his wound. Judith, call an ambulance. Stella shouted, rushing to Taylor. Her eyes filled with fear and helplessness. She didn't know how to help the wounded man, only grabbing his hand. Stella was stunned, realizing the gravity of the situation. Her fingers trembled. Judith immediately pulled out her phone and dialed the emergency number. Everything will be fine. Don't worry so much. Maybe you could just bandage my leg. Taylor tried to smile. Stella sat in the hospital, waiting for news. She couldn't shake the burning anxiety she felt for Taylor. She had fallen in love, and after so many hardships, she couldn't bear to lose that sudden beam of happiness that had emerged between them. When Neaton, the sister's lawyer, entered the room, Stella immediately rushed to him. Neaton, how is Taylor? What are the doctors saying? She asked hopefully. Unfortunately, he hasn't regained consciousness yet, but the doctor said the situation has stabilized. His body should hold up, Neaton said, shaking his head. Thank goodness, at least there's something good, Stella exhaled with relief. But you didn't come just for that, did you? Right? Indeed, the lawyer nodded. I have important news. Do you remember Ethan? How could I forget him? Stella frowned. It turns out he hasn't been idle. It seems Ethan lost money gambling, and then, to settle his debt, he gave the address and location of the valuables in your home to some criminals. What? Can he still threaten us? The news wrapped Stella's heart in a sticky web of fear, causing her soul to shudder. She hadn't anticipated this danger. You and Judith don't need to worry now. Ethan won't be able to harm you anymore. Thank you, Neaton. You really are our guardian angel. That's my job, he replied. Stella felt relief filling her soul. Her fears and anxieties began to fade, and she realized that their family would now be free from that curse. Six months after the home invasion, Stella and Judith's lives finally started to return to normal. Taylor had made a full recovery from his injury. Additionally, Stella had paid for his surgery to rid him of the hated limp. Taylor bravely underwent all the surgical procedures and was now recuperating during rehabilitation. A while later, at Stella and Taylor's wedding, there was an incredible atmosphere of happiness and joy. Everyone gathered to celebrate this special day. The guests were both surprised and delighted for Stella, and the celebration marked the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. I love you, Stella whispered, embracing Taylor. 
I love you, he replied, kissing his wife on the cheek. Judith happily watched her sister and her new husband, knowing they had made each other truly happy. After the wedding, Stella offered Taylor a position at the office, not as a janitor, but as an intern in the finance department. Within a year, he was preparing to take over the company, as it was time for Stella to go on maternity leave. 